Is everybody on? Yeah, Kate said she's um, she's going to log in and then we'll have to move her to the meeting. Okay. So do we have, are the attendees on? I can't tell. Nope. Everyone's here. We are good to go. Okay. Well, hi there. Um, sorry about the delay. We're just having some technical issues here. There's so many different ways to do this now. Um, so I'm Cecilia. I am the early career development chair of TCAN and really fortunate to have so many members of the sections committee coding committee to show their, share their wealth and knowledge um, about coding today. Um, and this session is really thanks to Dr. Scott Duncan, who really helped orchestrate and organize this, um, not only for members of TCAN, but just the wider neonatology community. Uh, Dr. Duncan is an endowed professor of pediatrics and chief of the division of neonatology at University of Louisville and has a ton of experience in neonatology, but also health services um, research and quality improvement in healthcare finances. He is a chair for the coding committee for the section of neonatal perinatal medicine. Um, and I'll hand this over to Dr. Duncan to introduce everybody else today. Hi, glad everybody could make it today. Sorry for the technical difficulties. We've got several members of the coding committee that are here. And we split this into about three different sections, some basics for academicians, some issues related to path guidelines. And then finally, for um, we also have some coding issues that we want to bring forward as well. Um, and so we have Jane Lee, who is um, one of our presenters. We have Carol Wong Ramsey, who is one of our presenters. Lisa Owens out of Texas is one of our presenters. Um, and then, of course, myself and Kate Stanley and Ted Rosencrantz will try to monitor the chat function. They're going to have to tell me to move slides ahead. So if you'll pardon the occasional interruption for that, um, I think we're ready to get started. Okay, thanks, Scott. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So uh, thank you for the kind introduction. I'm Dr. Kara Wong Ramsey coming to you from Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, so a brief overview of our agenda. We only have 60 minutes, so we'll be moving pretty quickly through this topic. Uh, we'd like to start off with some basic um, introductions to concepts of coding, some uh, basics of coding, uh, path guidelines, which is our um, guidelines that we will put on for uh, your tra medical trainee uh, physicians, and common documentation errors. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Uh, so disclosures, uh, none of us have anything to disclose. Next slide. Uh, so for the first part on coding basics, we're going to be talking about why coding is important, some of the more common CPT codes you use in the NICU, and we'll talk about some different scenarios where you would apply them. Next uh, slide. So briefly choosing a CPT code, um, this is the billing code that you're going to use, is generally based on the type of service that you are providing, the location of the service, whether the patient you're working with is a new or established patient, uh, whether this is a sick patient or a healthy patient, and um, whether the, the encounter is based on a cognitive encounter, uh, what we call an E&M versus a procedure related encounter, a single encounter or representing a cumulative management for a particular problem, as well as the complexity. Next uh, slide. Oh, next slide. There you go. Um, so most codes are, are based on time or decision making. Um, medical decision making, uh, we commonly abbreviate as MDM. Um, so as this, uh, some of our decisions we do, uh, we may choose to base on medical decision making. Others we may choose based on the total time spent on the encounter. If we do choose the time base, we must document the amount of total time that was spent on the encounter in our documentation. Um, so common things we'll use as neonatologists might include our hourly critical care code um, for options where we're involved in face-to-face -face transport, uh, transferring a hospital from one uh, facility or medical group to another, uh, or uh, certain consult codes. Next slide. However, when you're rounding in the NICU, most of the codes we're going to use are what's called global codes. So global codes, unlike being based purely on time or medical decision making, um, they, they represent uh, the care you provide in a 24-hour period uh, for a critical care baby or a baby who needs intensive level care. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
Um, along with this, there's this concept of bundled codes. So within global codes that we typically use within neonatology for patients admitted to the NICU, um, bundled codes include codes for various types of common procedures that are bundled within that global code and we cannot bill for them separately. Uh, next slide, please. So common uh, things would be uh, such as endotracheal intubation, uh, umbilical line placement, very common procedures that we typically do for a lot of our NICU babies. If the baby is admitted in the NICU and are billing with one of our global codes, uh, we are not able to bill for many of these common procedures separately. Uh, next slide. So next we'll move on into common CPT codes that we'll use in neonatology, specifically in the delivery room, in the inpatient care um, for both uh, in critical care babies as well as older convalescing babies, newborn care codes, as well as codes commonly used when you're discharging a patient from the hospital. Uh, next code, next page. So we'll start off with a brief scenario. So you're being asked to attend a C-section delivery uh, for a mom with preeclampsia who's pregnant at 27 weeks gestation. Uh, baby Lucy requires PPV and intubation in the delivery room with APGARS 4 and 8. Next page. Uh, so your delivery room attendance codes. Um, there are two common codes that we would use in the delivery room that represent our attendance there. Um, 99464 uh, is the most basic one and simply represents that you are uh, attending at the delivery and did some basic initial care of the baby. This may include um, drying and stimulation, blow by oxygen, uh, CPAP, um, discussion with the parents. Important requirements for your documentation in order to bill is you have to document who requested your presence. In our case, usually it's the obstetrical provider who's requesting the presence of neonatology. Um, next slide. In contrast, 99465 represents a higher level of resuscitation in the delivery room. So specifically, um, this code encompasses the need for giving positive pressure ventilation and chest compressions. Uh, please note that just giving face mask CPAP alone is not enough to qualify for this code. Um, CPAP alone would only be the 99464 as discussed earlier. Um, next slide. So as a brief run, everyone is familiar with this very basic charge from NRP. You can kind of think of it as if you only did those initial steps of NRP, that would encompass your 99464, versus if you went to the lower half of NRP where you're starting to do chest compressions, PPV, uh, epinephrine, that's when you're going to use the 99465 code. Next slide. So regarding procedures we might do in the delivery room. So unlike the admission to the NICU where we talked about how a lot of our procedures are encompassed within bundled care under your global code, doing these procedures in the delivery room, if they are done with the intention to stabilize the baby in the initial delivery room, these can actually be billed separately. So for example, if you were in the delivery room for a baby who you gave PPV and intubated, in addition to billing for 99465, you could also also billed separately for your intubation at 31500. Next slide. Um, of note, there is a CPT code for physician standby. There may be periods when you are asked to stand by for a delivery that does not happen for a prolonged period of time for a variety of reasons. Um, there is a code to bill for this. However, if you bill for the time spent on standby, this time cannot include any time that you are spent giving care to other um, children. Or, or, or babies. Um, you also must be immediately available or physically present while uh, on the standby mode as well. Um, and uh, you also cannot report this uh, concurrently with 99464. So if you if baby is eventually born and you do attend to the delivery, you can't use this code. This is only if you're on standby for a while and the delivery didn't happen. Um, next slide. So here's another scenario. This is uh, baby Lucy, the one we talked about earlier, who you intubated in the delivery room. So the baby is now transported to the NICU where you're admitting the baby, you're placing umbilical lines, and you give surfactant through the endotracheal tube. Which of these uh, CPT codes do you think you would bill for? I'll give you five seconds to think about it and we'll show the answer. Three, two, one, and we'll show the answer, Scott. Um, so the answer is, so uh, you can bill for the delivery room resuscitation. Um, 
And because the intubation was performed in the delivery room, um, you can bill for it separately. So a 99465 for the delivery room and then a separate code for the endotracheal intubation. Note that we didn't include the bill for the umbilical lines because the umbilical lines was not part of the initial delivery room resuscitation. The baby was already stabilized in the delivery room and you made the decision to then admit the baby to the NICU. And since the umbilical lines were placed after the initial stabilization from the delivery room, the umbilical lines are considered to be bundled as part of your uh, admission billing for the NICU, which we'll talk about next. Uh, next slide. Um, so in terms of admitting uh, your initial billing for the admission to the NICU, typically we're billing either a critical care day or an intensive care day. So what is the difference between the two? This is a really common question. So the definition of critical care in this most basic sense is an illness or injury that acutely impacts one or more vital organ systems such that there is a high probability of imminent or life-threatening deterioration in the patient's uh, condition. Um, you feel that the care you provide involves high complexity decision making in order to assess and support vital system function and treat organ system failure to prevent further deterioration and requires interpretation of multiple physiological parameters or application of advanced technology. Next slide. So um, these are some examples that we commonly see in the NICU that would fit the definition of critical care. Um, so generally, our most common examples are going to be babies admitted for respiratory failure who need um, positive pressure ventilation. Um, so either mechanical ventilation or non-invasive uh, mechanical ventilation um, are considered examples of things you would do for respiratory failure. Uh, hemodynamic instability requiring inotropes, um, pulmonary hypertension requiring nitric oxide, um, HIE babies requiring cooling, seizures requiring antiepileptic, uh, an advanced stage of neck um, that's requiring um, NPO antibiotics and uh, IV fluids to support the, the baby's uh, life, uh, or severe hypoglycemia requiring multiple changes in dextrose, and addition of perhaps other agents, including dioxide or glucagon. Um, Note that although extremely premature babies are at high risk for mortality and morbidity, the gestational age in and of itself does not justify a critical care code. What we use to justify a critical care code is the specific care that we are providing for the baby. Uh, next slide. So the initial critical care, if you admit a baby who falls under the definition of critical care, um, there are two codes that you could use. 99468 uh, will cover children who are 28 days or less. So this is probably gonna be the most common code most of us are going to use. However, there are some of us who um, admit babies who are older in our uh, neonatal intensive care units. So please note that if the child is 29 days old and up to 24 months, there's actually a different code you would use for the initial day. Uh, and this is called um, 99471. Um, and it represents a critical care level, but for an older child within these. So please note that both of these codes are global codes. So that means that if you are billing for either of these codes on the um, on admission, uh, you can't you cannot bill separately for procedures such as intubation and central line placement. So very different case from the delivery room scenario. Um, and then next, I'm going to be changing over to my partner, Dr. Jane Liu, who's going to be talking about our definitions of intensive care and observation monitoring. Hi, thank you, Kara. So next slide. So when we talk about intensive care observation and monitoring, this applies to infants who are not critically ill, but still require continuous or frequent monitoring, maybe frequent adjustments of therapy. But the underlying um, uh, uh, key here is constant observation by the healthcare team uh, under uh, direct supervision, and this is typically provided either in the NICU or in the step down uh, 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 facility area. And a good indicator for this is looking at, at nursing acuity to uh, see uh, to kind of get a sense of what the intensive services were provided. Next slide. Next slide. 
So with that, in terms of care observation and monitoring, the um, code that we would be using is 99477. And this is for the initial hospital care. And uh, it is a per day uh, charge and it's for infants that are 28 days or less and meet the criteria we just discussed. So this is age-based, it's a global code that's done daily and, and encompasses the bundled procedures. Next slide. So um, examples of this are uh, infant born to a diabetic mother who uh, uh, presents with hypoglycemia that needs some dextrous infusion and frequent lab monitoring, um, a preterm infant who is under continuous monitoring for apnea or prematurity, or an infant who has poor thermoregulation, some feeding issues that require either isolate support or frequent assessment of their feeding um, tolerance or cues. Um, it could also uh, represent a term infant with ABO incompatibility that uh, develops hyperbility rubinemia where you're using uh, aggressive intensive phototherapy and frequent uh, monitoring of the bilirubin levels, as well as the growing former preemie who has now BPD and is on low flow um, supplemental option via nasal cannula. Next slide. So uh, as far as hospital EM codes that are used for this uh, type of um, that is not necessarily a critical baby and not so ill um, and so and so doesn't meet the critical care codes or the intensive care um, uh, codes either and the level of service is dependent on either the level of medical decision making MDM or total time required to perform the service. So when we, when we talk about medical decision making we're we're including the complexity of the problems uh, any data analysis you're doing uh, it, on rounds and the risk to the baby. Um, when we look at initial hospital care codes uh, per day uh, for EM, e, uh, evaluation and management of a patient, we're looking at three codes. There's the 99223, which is hot, considered high complexity as far as medical decision making. Um, and if you're using time base is 75 minutes or more during that uh, visit that you're having with the uh, baby. A 99222 is considered moderate complexity or a time base 55 minutes or more. And the lowest category within this is 99221, which is considered low complexity and uh, taking about and or taking about 40 minutes of time. Please note in when you're using these codes, the procedures are considered non-bundled and it's really the critical uh, key here is either medical decision-making or time spent. Next slide. Some examples of this are uh, consider an infant who uh, is undergoing evaluation for sepsis and requires additional vital sign monitoring. Um, a hypoglycemic SGA infant who requires frequent glucose uh, evaluations and maybe treatment with glucose gel or uh, additional feeds, or a infant who is undergoing uh, congenital cardiac disease uh, workup in the nursery after birth and uh, has an echocardiogram done and cardiac consultation, but is admitted to the newborn nursery with maybe additional vital side checks. Next slide. So here's a scenario, baby Jane, who was born at 38 weeks, a few days old, and has signs of mild TTN and requires some nasal cannula support at 30%. Uh, she also has hypoglycemia and requires IV uh, dextrous support and uh, is under continuous cardiorespiratory monitoring and pulse oximetry. She was admitted to the NICU for TTN and hypoglycemia, which is believed to be likely transitional. So the question is, what is the appropriate code for this encounter? Is it A, 9946A, critical care mission? Uh, 99469, critical care admission for 29 days and older, 99477, in initial intensive care day, uh, or 99223, which is the high complexity inpatient hospital care. So the answer is, has everyone come up with theirs? 
This would be C, Initial Intensive Care Monitoring and Observation 99477. Next slide. So let's go back to baby Lucy. She was born at 27 weeks and intubated in the delivery room. After admission to the NICU, umbilical lines were placed and she received surfactant. Then she goes on and has a sepsis workup um, and antibiotics are started. She uh, was admitted to the NICU for prematurity, respiratory failure due to RDS, and evaluation and observation for sepsis. What would be the mission code for this baby? Uh, and the choices are 99468, admission critical care, 99477, intensive care, initial day, 99223, which is a level three inpatient admission. And then the procedures here are endotracheal intubation, surfactant administration, UVC, and UAC. Give you a few seconds here. So the answer is looking to see if anyone's put the answer in the chat. Critical care admission 99468. Next slide. So again, uh, Kara uh, mentioned this uh, in her portion. Uh, the bundle of procedures here, you've got to keep in mind which ones, uh, especially for the critical care codes and for the intensive care codes. A lot of these things we're doing on a daily basis. And if you document what you're doing as far as the continuous cardiorespiratory monitoring or the frequent uh, checks of vital signs by nursing, um, and other evaluations, you can see how uh, those codes can be uh, uh, um, given more substance when you're actually billing. Uh, next slide. So then we have to go on to the discussion. What happens with the next day and the next when we're talking about subsequent daily care? And we have to then continue to consider the same um, uh, ideas of critical, what's critical care, what's intensive care, and what's hospital care. Next slide. So critical care subsequent day. So this again is um, a code that we'll use 99469 for neonates who are 28 days or less, 99472 when you hit that 29 day mark up to 24 months. And this is an age-based uh, code, it's a global code, and you do this daily after the initial hospitalization day. So all the procedures are bundled when you're using this code. Next slide. Similarly, for intensive care, subsequent day, we're also uh, billing this as a global care, care code, and it's a daily uh, code, which has bundled procedures. But the difference here is that the three codes that are available are weight-based. So 99478 is, the, uh, is for a baby who meets a uh, criteria for intensive, but has a current body weight less than 1,500. 99479 is for a baby whose weight is 1,500 grams up to 2,500 grams. And 99480 is for a baby who's now weighing 2,501 grams up to 5,000 grams. Next slide. When we talk about hospital care subsequent day EM codes, we're talking again about the not so ill infant uh, who doesn't meet the criteria for either criteria, uh, critical or intensive care. And this uh, level of service is dependent again on medical decision making or time required to perform the evaluation and service. So here, similar to the initial day, we have three codes and they range between 99231 up to 99233, and the complexity code of medical decision-making is low, moderate, or high, and if you ba uh, bill based on, code based on time, it's 25 minutes or more for low complexity, 35 minutes or more for moderate, and 50 minutes or more for high complexity. Again, with hospital care codes, this is uh, a unbundled, code so you can code for procedures separately. Next slide. So what do you do about the baby who's over 5,000 grams but still requires intensive care observation? 
In this scenario, we would use the subsequent day hospital care EM code of 99231 up to 99233. Next slide. So baby Lucy is now 30 days old. She's transitioned to high flow nasal cannula at a liter and on 21% oxygen. She weighs now 15, 10 grams and she's tolerating some uh, gavage feedings. She's getting her feeds readjusted for weight gain. She's shown some signs of feeding cues at this point, but uh, she's still requiring some supplemental uh, medications like uh, sodium supplements for hyponatremia and getting uh, continuous monitoring for intermittent apnea uh, that requires occasional stimulation. And she's being weaned from an isolate. She requires care for prematurity her apnea, her hyponatremia, and thermoregulation and nutritional support. So what is the appropriate care code for Lucy at this time? Great, all right, so the answer is C. So the reason why it's C is actually, correction, uh, the person who put it in is actually it should be D because the baby is now 1510 grams. So apologies, we will correct the slide when um, the uh, webinar is over to reflect that. Um, next slide. Right answer, wrong letter. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so, what do you do in this particular scenario of treating respiratory failure with high flow nasal cannula? When does it meet the cr uh, cr critical care criteria? So, we have to go back to what defines critical care. Uh, documentation should show that the high flow nasal cannula flow simulates CPAP, and it doesn't really matter what type of uh, oxygen support that is, and it varies by institution. Um, the baby needs to meet the illness criteria for critical care. So impairment of one or more vital organs systems, such as that there's a high probability of imminent or life threatening deterioration of the patient's overall status. And so you have to document the, that this meets the criteria for a distending pressure or CPAP, and that if the therapy is removed, the patient's at risk for life threatening respiratory decompensation. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Jane, yes. the other thing I would add is that when people have looked at um, high flow nasal cannula and what kind of pressures they uh, generate, you need about two liters to simulate yeah. CPAP. So frequently as a practical means, if you're on two liters or more, you're critical. If you're on less than two liters, intensive. Yeah. And each each hospital has a slightly different definition, and it, it I think depends a little bit on how their, their the use of high flow is within your system. Um, in that particular example we had about Lucy, she was on one liter, so that was trying to suggest that that's you know the differential between critical care and intensive care. Um, thanks, Ted, for that. Um, the next slide is uh, this is uh, normal newborn codes. So these codes. Encompass three. 99460 is your initial day, regardless of the birthday, and requires initial exam, counseling. Um, 99462 is for your subsequent normal newborn days. And uh, 99463 should be used for our normal newborn admission and discharge on the same day. Again, these are global daily codes. And if you do procedures separately, they can be built separately. Next slide. So uh, the last, uh, uh, we're getting to the end of uh, this portion here. Discharge, how much time does it take? That really is what uh, is the criteria for what you're coding for that day. So 99238 is if your discharge day management takes less than 30 minutes, 99239 if it exceeds 30 minutes or more. Uh, the management here really encompasses your exam, any uh, discussion or instructions to the family, uh, the follow-up planning you uh, do for uh, outpatient care, documentation of prep uh, preparation as far as prescriptions, appointment cards, et cetera, and the actual documentation. Now, all of this has to be done on the day of service. So you can't bill for uh, any of these management uh, uh, things that you're doing 
prior to the day of service. Um, and what's important is you have to document that your presence and total time for the care you provided. This is not to be used for inter-hospital transfers. Next slide. So when you do transfer, we have to look at whether you're transferring to a different group at a separate facility or if you're transferring to a different specialty within the hosp hospital you're in. So when you're transferring uh, to a different group or at a, a separate facility, the transferring physician codes are time-based critical care codes or subsequent hospital care EM codes, whereas the receiving physician may uh, code for the global critical care or intensive care code. When you're transferring to a different specialty within the same hospital, again, the transferring physician will, uh, build, will code for the subsequent hospital EM code, and the receiving physician can build for the code, uh, global code, whether it's critical or intensive care. Next slide. So at this point, Karen and I are open for any questions. Um, if there are nothing really pressing, we'll go on to the next uh, topic because I want to be mindful of the time we have and we can answer questions at the end. I think we're just doing uh, questions in the chat, Jane. Uh, that okay, perfect. So we'll continue uh, doing the questions in the chat and we'll go on to the next uh, topic. Lisa? Hi, thanks, Jane. Um, I know this topic may not um, pertain to everybody, but people who work in an environment where there are learners, fellows, residents, or students, these are the guidelines for um, billing. Um, so the um, physicians at teaching hospitals or PATH um, are the guidelines that we have from the GME and, and CMS who administers Medicaid um, that lay out what the requirements are um, for billing. Uh, next slide. So the guidelines are pretty specific um, that Medicaid will pay for services in a teaching hospital when the services meet the following criteria. That the teaching physician provides a service personally, or the teaching physician was present during the critical or key parts of a procedure, or they have independently seen the patient and reviewed the plan with the trainee. Um, you know, this is difficult because there's always a tension uh, trying to let our trainees have some autonomy, but yet providing the supervision that's required by ACGME and as well as PATH. So um, the more independent you let people be, you have to be very specific about how you can interact with the patient to uh, be reimbursed. Uh, next slide. Okay, the neonatologist is on call and is in-house. The fellow goes to the delivery room, performs a resuscitation on a late preterm infant using the basic steps of NRP. The fellow notifies the attending physician and they debrief. The physician attests the delivery note. Can the physician submit a bill for this encounter? Based on what we just talked about, is this something that the physician should um, submit a charge? I would say it depends. If the physician went and looked at the baby, then yes, they can bill. Uh, if they just, if the fellow went to the delivery room by themselves and all they did was talk about it, then no, they should probably should not. So uh, when you have trainees, you all know, we attest, attest their notes um, and you indicate that you su were in direct supervision of the, of the um, trainee during the procedure that you've reviewed all the elements with them. Um, and that's what we do for trainees in, is an attestation. Next slide. APPs are not trainees, so the PATH guidelines don't apply, and we also don't attest an APP's note. So, also, depending on the scenario in the environment that they're in, APPs can bill independently, depending on what the employment model is, uh, if they're employed by the hospital or employed by your group. If they have their own NPI number, they can bill independently, as long as they have hospital privileges, it's in your particular state scope of practice, and that they are on approved by the third party payers. Uh, if you are working with APPs, you would like to use their documentation. Uh, I think it's fine to use it. However, you must indicate that you yourself have personally examined the patient and that you all have discussed um, the plan. It's fine to say refer to nurse practitioner note for plan, but you must d demonstrate that you've examined the baby and that you have participated in the care for you to submit a bill separately. And that's all I have on this topic. We'll move on to our next discussion. Yeah, I let me 
real quick through this slide on APPs in at the end of leases, a couple of slides. The nurse practitioner and the APPs are always a very tricky subject when you're dealing with them. You have to be aware of what their employment model is. And in fact, if they're employed by the hospital, you also have to know if they're included in the Medicare report that goes to CMS as to whether they can even bill independently or not. There was a huge lawsuit, a whistleblower suit, and the um, hospital corporation was found to be um, an error to the tune of $48 million where physicians were billing for APP services when the APPs were hired by the hospital. So be very, very careful when you're dealing with APPs. I avoided having anything on split and shared services because split and shared services don't apply to our global daily codes. That's a totally different subject and it's really too much to get into here. Just be aware that the APPs can be a very slippery slope and make sure that you have sound ground that you're standing on when you're figuring out how you work with them. And, and I would say uh, where I work, uh, the nurse practitioners are employed by the hospital and we generate our own entire note every day. We don't use, we don't say refer to an NP note. We write our, if we're gonna bill, we write an entire note that is our own. So, okay, we can move on. I think. I just wanted to go over a few um, common documentation errors that medical coders see. I'm the uh, medical coder, not a physician. So this is from sort of the perspective of those of us that are reviewing the documentation against the, uh, the coding. Next slide. So some of the more common ones we see are related to, um, as we just spoke about the nurse practitioner and physician daily note, if it's a combined note, um, that represents the service of both the physician and the nurse practitioner. Sometimes we are missing the physician component of that documentation, thus the document, even though it was built under a physician, the note itself only supports a nurse practitioner service. Another is the documentation of time. We discussed time. So if your discharge service, um, all the time you've spent on the date of discharge home, is greater than 30 minutes, we need to see that documented in order for you to be able to bill 99239. Coders are not allowed to extrapolate and say, oh, you know, looking at the, the volume of this content, I'm, I'm sure they spent more than 30 minutes. It has to be explicitly stated for a coder to allow a 99239. Other time documentation, um, uh, time-based critical care codes. So if you are transferring out, and it was mentioned earlier on the transfer slide, if you're transferring out to another facility and the patient is critical, the receiving group is gonna bill another group, they're gonna bill the global critical care code, and the sending group would bill time-based critical care for time spent, um, time documented as having been spent providing critical care on that date of transfer. So we need to make sure the time is noted on those transfer notes. Um, missing in the path attestation, the teaching physician attestation. If the note's initiated by a resident, you can't just co-sign the note. You need to have your attestation and your information that illustrates that you examined the patient, per, you know, were there personally, were present for the key and are critical portions, and or you saw the patient independently and reviewed that resident's note. We also look at, sometimes there are discrepancies in clinical documentation. Um, the use of copy functionality or copy forward from EHR is great for history, um, but it can sometimes get us into trouble where there's conflicting information left in a note. Um, in, the, in the NICU, we see examples where the respiratory support is still listed in one area of the note, but in another area, it says they were, were weaned off under room air. Um, so here they have you know, vet settings and here it, it says they're, they're on room air. Um, or there's a form of respiratory support documented, but there's no diagnosis to indicate what their respiratory um, diagnosis is that, that is causing the, the need for that. And then another thing we see is apnea, you know, patients, um, the diagnosis of apnea may be listed and apnea is a diagnosis where depending on um, the detail that you, you've placed on the note, it may support it may be used to support your critical care billing or not, um, whether the patient's having episodes, if it's unstable, et cetera. Next slide. So for your nurse practitioner and physician daily notes, obviously that's a very widespread and acceptable practice to both have the same note or be in the same note. But while that one note may be generated for the cumulative um, documentation, 
If the physician is going to be rendering the service and billing, the physician should have some original documentation, even if it's as a supplement to the nurse practitioner note, um, especially as it pertains to the detail that applies to that to that day. Um, and really quick, just making sure also that the physician is not only adding some of their own original documentation, but is signing off on that note. You can go to the next slide. Um, as we went over earlier for discharge coding, there are two codes when a patient's discharged home. One is 30 minutes or less, one is greater than 30 minutes. And if you bill, if you want to report 99239, um, your documentation needs to include an explicit statement that greater than 30 minutes was spent on that date of service. It does not include any discharge planning you did leading up to that date. It only represents the time you spent on the calendar date of discharge. Next slide. Again, your time-based critical care for transfers. We need to make sure your total time is documented in the medical record. It must be the time spent specific to that patient. Um, time spent reporting, time spent performing separately billable procedures would not be included in that total time because you're billing for the procedure time when you build the procedure. Because um, remember your time-based critical care does not bundle everything that's bundled in your global daily codes. There, um, some things are, but not everything. So really be aware of the difference and what you can bill um, separately with the time-based. And then if by chance, which is probably not likely, you spend less than 30 minutes providing critical care on a calendar date for a transfer, I guess, unless they transfer out before you know 1230 AM, um, that might be one scenario. But if it's less than 30 minutes on a date, um, you would report it with a, an appropriate hospital care code. Next slide. So teaching physicians, as she stressed earlier, um, for teaching physician services, you, you, it, you, the documentation must reflect that either you were present for the key or critical portions of the service or um, that you performed an exam and discussed you know, the, the care plan with the resident. It cannot just be a co-signature. Um, when it is a time-based service, such as time-based critical care, say for that transport out to another facility, an inter-facility trans, um, transfer, only the teaching physician's time should be counted. Your resident should not be including their time on the note and then you using it to support your service. So just your time. Next slide. Copy functionality. So the use of copy forward in EHR is very useful, especially when and as you're documenting the historical narrative of that patient that got you to that point. Um, you don't want to have to restate everything you just stated yesterday or the day before. But what you have to be sure of is that you review it and update anything that's changed, um, because that does lead to the discrepancies that I noted earlier. Um, update anything that's changed and add anything new, different, um, for today. Um, when you when you compare today's visit to yesterday's visit to the day before, even if there's a slight change, now obviously you don't, you know, we're not asking you to fabricate or go too far or anything like that, but if it's a tiny change, go ahead and note that very minor change and move on. It, it's not that um, it is unacceptable for day-to-day -day patients who are the same status day-to-day -day to reflect that, but just if that is not the case, make sure you're updating your notes. When you are signing your note, you are laying claim to the content of that note. So if something was copied forward and missed, you, you've laid claim to that, that verbiage or that, that documentation. Next slide. And then some of the documentation discrepancies that we, we you know, that I see, um, again, are centered on respiratory support. It seems to be a, a, a significant one where discrepancies might take place, and that is where for example, the respiratory support is still documented in one section of the note, and in another one it says the baby's, you know, on room air and, and it's not on support. So just making sure that um, ending or, you know, closing or stating that, you know, the respiratory support has ended on a certain date is important. Um, and then make sure that if your patient is on respiratory support that you've identified the appropriate diagnosis, which is also important for your hospital partners. Oftentimes that respiratory diagnosis is going to assist them in their in their coding for um, their DRGs. 
And then last but not least, you know, apnea, making sure that um, if a patient has apnea, you're clear as to whether or not it's unstable, they're having issues, they're being treated um, actively, or it's just something that they're still being monitored for, but they haven't had any issues, say, in the last 24 hours. So being clear on that apnea can help assist support your, your daily code. And I think that wraps up my um, medical coder's perspective of some documentation errors we see in NICU documentation. Yes, thank you all. Thank you for all the presenters as well. And I've been trying to keep a half an eye out on the chat. There's been a lot of good questions in there. Um, we've got maybe about five minutes or so if there are other questions that um, folks might want to ask or entertain. I'm sure we'd be happy to. Or if the other panelists um, Ted, you and Kate, and um, have been uh, monitoring the, the chat if there are particular topics that um, you think would be worthwhile mentioning. I will add one quick one, and it was the thing that Katie said at the very end of hers or towards the end of hers about not updating your note and doing copy forward. We've started to see claim denials from copy forward where there hasn't been something updated to it. You don't have to update a tremendous amount of it, but it, at least somewhere in there, the best way I describe it to my group is, is your note should tell a story. Even if the child is still on 30% oral feedings, I make a notation that was seen by speech therapy that day that we've ordered a uh, barium swallow, that he fed better or he fed a little bit worse or mother was successful, something that tells a story that takes you from point A to point B as, as you think about this patient's hospitalization. So I think that that copy forward is great for us. And I had one hospital system say, well, we might take it away. And I thought, oh my heavens, you have no idea what you're asking us to do. <laughs> if we have to rewrite that note every single day from scratch. Ted, do you or Katie have any closing comments? No further comment. I'm actually replying to something in the chat here. Yeah, I think uh, uh, there's some questions uh, that are a little bit more detailed and may need to be uh, covered in a separate webinar as far as looking more into uh, some of the functional echoes that are being done and uh, going more in depth with consultation codes and uh, fellow participation. But I think we have too little time right now to delve into those. There's also some questions about hospital uh, coding versus uh, independent uh, physician codes. Yeah, I, I can make a quick comment on the uh, focused ultrasounds. There are codes in existence already for some of those focused ultrasounds. Um, as far as I can tell, most of those are not bundled into our global codes. But remember, there are certain requirements that you have to do with you're going to do point of care ultrasound. One is uh, an interpretation. One is uh, archival storage of the images that you've taken. We need to write some sort of a note that says the indication, the results, and whether or not there's a change in management, that sort of a thing in order to bill any of those limited ultrasound codes that you may find in the CPT manuals. What I think, Scott, I think one of the interesting things is going to be, um, you know, some people are now putting in pick lines using point of care ultrasound. And are you only going to be able to bill for the pick? Or is there going to be some different code for putting in a central line with ultrasound? I have a Good feeling time, that uh, putting it in one way or the other is going to end up being the same code. You're not going to anything extra for doing it under ultrasound supervision or something like that. I think you're right, except a higher success rate, perhaps. Well, there will be a higher success rate. <laughs> it's like, you know, you get a, a different billing code if you're using direct laryngoscopy or some of the uh, video laryngoscopes. Right. There may be a higher success rate, but so far people only recognizing intubation. There's also some comments here about if there, uh, there are additional uh, questions, if they can email 
a specific uh, uh, email. Um, Scott, would you say to email the um, representative of that district or is there a general email we can provide? You can email me. I would ask you to email the general representative of the district first, but I just stuck my email. I'm really bad with email, so if it's a week goes by, don't be surprised at that because I get way behind with stuff. And you do have a district representative for each district right now. We're taking applications for district six, I think. Uh, Jane Brumbaugh is going to be an editor of Neo Reviews, I believe is where she's gone to. And with that, um, we need to, to replace her position. So if anybody's in District 6 and interested, send me a CV and just some kind of a statement as to why you're interested. You should also be aware, I guess, as a closing thing, the coding committee does more than just simply education. And a lot of the folks uh, ahead of me uh, were very instrumental in getting these types of codes set up and operational. The most recent things that we did actually involved um, total body cooling. And so there's a long process, not for today, but there's a long process to get a new code into place. We've been asked to look at other codes and see whether or not we were interested in bringing them in. And some of those, a lot of those most recently we've, we've declined to, to pursue, but your coding committee does more than simply education. And if you have questions, please feel free to um, send me a note or um, you could send any of us a note or even to your district representative. I guess I would add to that is, um, I think as neonatologists, we need to be grateful that you know, the people who formed this committee who were very proactive and got a lot of these codes going, it really made it so that the neonatologists are in a much better position to get appropriate reimbursement for the work we do. Yes. Lastly, uh, will these slides or uh, will the um, recorded um, webinar be available? I think it's the last question here. That... I have no problems forwarding, and forwarding, forwarding these slides to um, Caitlin or Cecilia. Um, and then the webinar is recorded, isn't that correct? That is correct. Okay. Now I I don't know how you get a hold of it, but I know it's been recorded. Okay. Well, thank you all for attending. Uh, we appreciate the time you've taken out of your day. Thank you.